it is about the press it's about the nation it's about the contemporary experience of india we have chosen uh, today as it is a watershed moment in the freedom struggle so april, it it was a, on april 8 bhagat singh and badgeshwar that throw smoke bomb in central legislative assembly to protest to register their protest against the public safety bill and also trade disputes bill that was those, those were the names given it will be interesting to know that the public safety bill that we know is known in britain parliament with a different name deportation of communists bill deportation of communists bill that was the whole idea because uh, around 31 uh founding uh, members of the indian communist movement at that time were arrested uh, in meerut when they want to they were uh, skeptical about how to control the uh, public discussion about the uh, uh, british actions and it, it was high time simon commission visited it, it uh, suggested certain, certain recommendations Uh, there was an agreement uh, with uh, uh, irwin so in this background the whole idea of public safety bill is to scuttle the dissent to scuttle the public debate as a part of the uh, if we go through the conditions uh, clauses what we say clauses of the bill in the public safety bill there are several similarities what uh, with what we are uh, discussing now like uapa but like in, in similar to the uh, to that of uapa in public safety bill also there was a clause while arresting you did not to reveal any cause you did not to tell the person or allegedly accused under what grounds under what condition under what allegations he is been he is being arrested there are several such clauses were there so against those bills bhagat singh and uh, badgeshwar that throw the bomb, smoke bomb and media it has its own role in any nation's uh, life in our uh, the press inquiry commission press law inquiry commission that was appointed by the constituent assembly gave a very interesting uh, definition to the journalists and ma- mass media they say let me read out Uh, talking about the journalists they are the current historians journalists are the current historians and current history is not written only in parliament or in chancellors chancelleries it is written in the in the way of life of a great majority of the people the kind of things they do and talk about the kind of values they set for themselves the amusement they follow the sort of things even when they are silly things but they are of interest to them this is the role of the journalist he has to report on a wide variety of issues aspects not only uh, customized capsule capsules to be uh, published and they also say that the modern press itself is a new phenomenon at that time it is typical unit is the great agency of mass communication these agencies can facilitate thought and discussion that's the purpose of uh, uh, that's the role of the media in the nation's life they can stifle it they can also stifle the debate what we are seeing seeing uh, in a contemporary india for the last 10 years they can debase and vulgarize the mankind also so it's very interesting to go through the uh, press inquiry uh, press law inquiry report for any interesting journalist it is uh, uh, amazing and they conclude the freedom of speech and of uh, publication 
consist primarily not in the liberty of individual to speak or write they consider it is the liberty of the nation to know to acquaint me to understand to assess the developments so this is the role of the uh, media the constituent assembly visualize so they, they also says that when if the democracy is to work satisfactorily if the democracy is to work satisfactorily ordinary men and women should feel that they have some share in the government they have some say in the government and also they have some share in the government so without the uh, public participation the constituent assembly uh, appointed committee feels that it, it may not be treated as a democracy so it, it, it is such kind of white uh, canvas i thought of uh, introducing the book that was uh, uh, titled that is titled as uh, one thing <clears throat> the captive press in third reef well germany offered so many experiences to the world not only in uh, advancement of scientific technology and also introducing a new phenomena of social mobilization called fascism nazism under nazism they managed they handled managed maneuvered the media to suits their interests to the extent they even did all kind of things what we are uh, visual uh, looking uh, what we are experiencing in today's uh, india so i thought there is a contemporary relevance of this book so immediately uh, I, I, when i the idea came to my mind i shared this idea with mk venu and also paranjeda and tista didi all three of them uh, are kind enough to accept my request i also requested uh, professor adapa sachinarayana who is uh, his professor in history he was a former uh, jnu student and also had uh, uh, a small stint in germany i believe uh, as a part of his research so i requested him to uh, chair the session of course manamanji pustakam is only channel that dedicates to discuss and introduce the books of the contemporary indian relevance and it wants to be a part to, to develop the common memory of the current issues so with the same uh, team of people are working on this and we have uh, uh, close to 12000 uh, subscription is a uh, uh, non supported by uh, uh, so not supported by any uh, ads and uh, corporate thing is a purely out of uh, initiation of a few individuals is a small initiation from our side adapa garu i hand over the session to you switch on the mic switch on the mic yes uh, am i yeah. audible yeah yes okay. yes sure. so now uh, we have uh, <clears throat> uh, two discussions now three three okay including yeah. including you okay uh, uh i can start with reno you yes. can start with them again right yeah um so what i will uh, do is to briefly uh, present uh the book uh, the captive press in the third rise uh this book consists of eight chapters and in about uh, 350 pages uh it is in fact uh, a comprehensive uh review as well as an account of the way the press of freedom of flourished or unflourished uh, in the third rise and what is interesting or uh, central to uh, the book uh, apart from uh, the issues of freedom of the press uh, journalist as a press coolie 
in the service of the Nazi state. I think the essence of the book is to examine how You have to. Uh, um, please unmute. We can't hear anything, huh? Vinaya, can you ask Mr. Padapa to unmute? Can't hear anything. Into Padapa, can unmute just call him. Mike, Mike, you are not audible. No, no. Padapa, can't see him. Can't see him either. No. Padapa, can you? You are not audible. No. Yeah, now he's visible. His mic has gone. He is visible, but uh, there is some. It seems some problem. No, we'll 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 continue. I'll I'll coordinate with him later. Uh, now I let me give a ring once to him. Maybe some Wi-Fi issue at his end. Yeah, maybe some kind of issues. आह मैं वाइस राउट लेता हूँ आह माइक को चेस करने वेनों ने पिलस करना तरबत मेरो वन मैसेज के अंदर ही इस लेफ्ट या या जॉइन दे जॉइन द गेम जॉइन द गेम दे इस ट्राइंग टू डू दैट आई थिंक टू रीकनेक्ट आई थिंक देर आर सम कनेक्शन इश्यूज या yeah we can hear now yeah am i audible sir yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. audible yeah yes so i was uh, uh, trying to i was i was telling that you know the captive press in the third reich uh is a book which consisted of you know eight chapters and uh, in about 350 pages a comprehensive account was uh, provided and central to uh, the book i think is the notion that journalist a press coolie in the service of the nazi state i think the this sums up the essence of the book as to how the state control by the nazis nazi propaganda to employ the press not only for propaganda but also as an instrument of social control and integration i think this is vital how press could be used to control and also to exercise authority of the state and in this case you know the uh, the 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 power of the nazi party uh, and its leader and in this book it is very clearly brought out as to how the nazi party succeeded in establishing a monopoly in terms of the propaganda of a distinctive ideology and in fact in the uh, years between 1928 uh, and 33 the nazi press in fact witnessed rapid growth there was regimentation of the publishers party ownership and control of the press and the press as an instrument of the party and state and the nationalist nationalist so national socialist press has successfully eliminated the other <coughs> contending uh, 
press namely or uh, in the case of germany it is very important the socialist and the communist press was totally liquidated and their properties uh, and uh, machinery was seized i mean this is outright uh, annihilation of the tradition that existed in, in the third reich and uh, i think there may be some tendencies of uh, of the sort uh, in contemporary uh, uh, india maybe you know when we uh, discuss in detail we will see how uh, the present uh, situation as it is unfolding uh, in india uh, have some relevance or have some comparisons uh, to the kind of a uh, situation that existed under the uh, nazi regime uh what is peculiar uh, to the uh, to the nazi uh, press policy is the purge of the press in fact not only the socialist and the communist press was liquidated even the church for example the catholic church has a very uh, distinctive you know sort of identity uh, and presence uh, uh, in, uh, in particularly in, uh, in southern germany in bavaria for example and uh, those uh, papers were uh, controlled and the kind of uh, control that existed and the regimentation and the pressure that was put on the journalists is quite uh, substantial i think uh, here i think uh, certain uh, elements of such a tendency are in fact uh, becoming visible uh, in the contemporary uh, india you know uh, how uh, a subtle kind of a pressure uh, existed as uh, exercised uh, by the uh, state and its uh, supporting agencies uh, on the journalists and uh, though uh, the ruling party uh, in india and the uh, state uh, so far did not uh, exercise full control of the press as such as we uh, uh, witnessed uh, uh, in the 1930s uh, both in uh, germany and italy uh, the trends are, uh, are becoming uh, you know a sort of uh, uh, a clear indication such a such a uh, you know tendency uh, is present and today we have a number of instances you know where uh, an informal uh, censorship and uh, state control or the party control or the ideological apparatus that is uh, you know that is at work uh, in contemporary india uh, you know has some kind of a uh, similarities uh, with the situation uh, in the 1930s uh, germany uh, and for that matter italy also so my reading uh, of this book um, in fact uh, uh, reveals as to how uh, the journalists you know were converted uh, as press police in the service of the nazi state and i think this we may take as a kind of a central concept of our uh, discussion uh, you know in the deliberation of uh, that ensues you know perhaps we will uh, uh, concentrate a little bit on how uh, uh, the uh, journalists um, are being you know transformed uh, as the police you know the uh, editors the the, the uh, editorial of uh, freedom uh, is being uh, increasingly cut the journalists uh, in fact in certain instances have become uh, uh, you know champions of the uh, propagandists of certain uh, ideologies and uh, the kind of uh, ideal uh, press freedom uh, that uh, was visualized uh, by uh, the nehruian uh, you know agenda was uh, uh, is being uh, eroded you know uh, Uh, i think as a student of history uh, i know that in the uh, in the early uh, stages of uh, national reconstruction uh, uh, during the uh, neuron era has in fact upheld you know 
uh, elements of uh, democratic uh, <coughs> and uh, i think that that kind of a uh, uh, democratic uh, tradition that that flourished during the first 15 years of post independent india particularly under the neurian uh, neuro neurian regime uh, is uh, being increasingly eroded so therefore the question now arises as to how the present day uh, no. and developments could have possible comparison uh, with the 1930s uh, developments uh, in, in in germany can we you know sort of make a comparison uh, between uh, the situation in india at the present and uh, you know the situation that uh, prevailed uh, in germany and in europe uh, in the 1930s but uh, while reading this book i was uh, very much fascinated you know by the uh, by the uh, developments you know that took place uh, during the uh, third reich and uh, the kind of uh, similarities that could be uh, you know drawn um, you know uh, in, in 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 contemporary situation so therefore uh, i would argue that this book has so many things to offer as to how the press freedom should be upheld what are the mechanisms because as 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 in india today i think in the 1930s the civil society in, in germany was not uh, i think uh, was not uh, totally democratized so the democratic tradition in germany had a not a very long trajectory uh, uh, given the prussian uh, state and its uh, instrumentality and the the uh, uh, the prussian uh, code of conduct uh, the prussian um, uh, traditions of regimentation uh, were very much uh, seen uh, in the 1930s uh, in my understanding what hitler does successfully is to uh, is to in a way revive and reinforce the uh, the prussian tradition i think one of the reasons why uh, the press became captive in the 1930s is perhaps uh, because of the lack of a democratic tradition as we understand uh, in the liberal bourgeois democratic traditions of of, of england or of france uh, you know uh, or, or or usa so what i what i feel is that this lack of the democratic tradition and if you like the democratic mentality uh, or in the case of germany has contributed uh, for the for the rise of uh, nazism and the kind of uh, you know uh, uh, a revival of the of, of, of the of the of the prussian uh, tradition uh, in the garb of of, of, of of nazi uh, ideology uh, and the question still remains as to how and why didn't the democratic tradition uh, prevail uh, in the civil society of the 1930s uh one as a, a kind of a uh, one way to look at it is that uh given the uh, german uh, tradition historically speaking uh, it's uh, it's authoritarian uh, regimes it's uh, uh, it's uh, state the exercise of the state power and uh, the, the the order and the regimentation that was that was very much present uh, in the in the long history of uh, of of oppression a state you know perhaps uh, you know got revived uh, in the 1930s and uh, like all other freedoms uh, press freedom uh, became the uh, you know main uh, what to call a uh, victim of regimentation so therefore uh, with this few remarks uh, i would now uh, invite uh, the uh, the opinion of the scholars where are who, who should start first mk venu yeah venu 
<coughs> so uh, thank you very much for uh, for inviting me to this discussion i uh, uh, i broadly uh, concur with the uh, uh with the I don't know when he says that uh, it's possible that lack of uh, uh, long democratic tradition uh, uh, could have been uh, one reason uh, why uh, why media uh, got so quickly captured uh, uh, in Germany in the late thirties uh, in, in the early thirties uh, as Hitler uh, consolidated his power. Uh, <clears throat> it's it it seems it, it it seems evident that 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 as he consolidated power across uh germany uh, uh after he he kept uh, winning uh, elections even in the, in the in the provinces uh, uh he uh, he was able to uh, completely centralize <coughs> and capture uh the media that existed at that time which by the way was very diverse uh in fact i'll i'll just uh, make uh but what i found fascinating uh, in this book uh is that that there is a period after world war 1 uh when <coughs> german media uh, uh became became very uh, uh became very diverse and very robust uh with over 5000 uh, or there about i think the number is there in the book newspapers and periodicals you know for a small country like that 5000 uh, uh periodicals 6000 periodicals uh, a newspaper and periodical uh to my mind was what a big number because even contemporary india uh with uh, which is sub subcontinent size <laughs> uh, country that we have uh with whatever 28 29 states uh, uh the number of newspaper and periodicals uh, are uh, roughly about that much uh, it's in that region you know <clears throat> maybe a little more but uh, you know 5 uh, 6000 uh, so germany uh, what surprised me uh, when i saw some of the statistics uh, that was uh, offered by the author was that the the media had various uh, this was before hitler consolidated this part uh, in the 10 years media uh, uh, media was very uh, very diverse media was very uh, uh, it offered a, a, a multi kind of uh, you know a multi faceted or multi uh, uh, facetted the uh, uh, you know uh, uh, use of opinion and news and uh, and it and and this this was also this could happen because there was a very uh, uh, thriving multi party system uh, with social democratic party as uh, the catholic uh, center the the, the communist uh, party media all they were very strong in their own respect a uh, very uh, very uh, uh, very robust very uh, active and besides besides the party run uh, publications uh, there was what is described in the book as a as a thriving middle class press uh, family owned media uh, uh, and all these uh, constituted uh, a very very uh, wide spectrum uh, of uh, of media uh, uh, newspapers periodicals and uh, 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 that were on offer and uh, and and one of the things that i notice is that that even on in small towns of the small population of say 20000 30000 uh, there would be like four or five newspapers which which subsequently uh, interestingly when hitler consolidated power in 1933 uh, uh, he he brought uh, uh, he, he brought uh, some very draconian ordinance uh, and 
precisely to to cut down the number of uh, you know publications in fact that ordinance uh, one ordinance was called uh, uh, was described as uh, uh, its objective was described as as reducing the number of publications in in, in germany and uh, and, uh, and they they call, they, they called them economically unviable the, they they decided by themselves uh, uh, max amon you know the man who was in charge of hitler's uh, who had his publication uh, uh, publishing uh, 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 enterprise uh, who is, was instrumental in uh, amon was instrumental in uh, uh, in, in Uh, in, in 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 consolidating uh, and capturing the almost the entire media uh, in in the 30s between 19 uh, say 30 and 1934 35 uh, so he he argues uh, in an ordinance they say that there is no need for so many newspapers why should a town with 30000 population have five newspapers uh, so so just uh, it is not economically viable that they, they themselves decide that uh, that there is a need to just just reduce the numbers Precise, precisely because if they reduce the number, they'll be able to control them better also. So, 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 so the point I'm making is uh, there was there was a lot of uh, diversity uh, uh, in the earlier years. Uh, 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 as I said, uh, there was a multi-party system. In in, in a sense, there was uh, there was some democratic uh, you know impulse at that time. You know the the communists, the social democratic uh, uh, party, Catholic Center. Uh, you know, small uh, family-owned uh, uh, papers, uh, middle-class, uh, uh, what is called middle-class press. Uh, uh, you know, technical publications, uh, specialist publications, weeklies, newspapers. So, so all this uh, after Hitler consolidated power in the uh, uh, post uh, in the early thirties. Uh, slowly, they they started just uh, uh, centralizing and capturing the. Media in in a in multiple ways. Uh, one way straight away was <coughs> just to banish the communist uh, uh, publications uh, and uh, publications uh, and uh, even socialist uh, party pub- publications were also uh, <coughs> uh, you know their properties were seized. Uh, they, they they brought laws. They 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 found ways of of com- completely sort of uh, owning the uh, uh, either this. Dist- either just uh, killing the newspapers or they just uh, came up with laws to own the party would own nazi <coughs> party would own the big ones which were doing well and some of them were run by by, by jewish families uh, so in fact the biggest newspaper uh, which is called uh, I, i don't know whether i'm pronouncing it right ulstein group it had uh, several newspapers periodicals uh, and had uh, circulation that in that uh, before in 1929 it had still had circulation of <coughs> of 1.8 million uh, by 33 by 32 1932 it was reduced circulation was reduced by by 90% and uh, uh, and then by then uh, ordinances were brought uh, 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 new laws were brought to enable the party uh, to just buy out the uh, paper in fact the the, the first plan is to to actually just just kill the publication uh, the ulstein group <coughs> uh, then uh, uh, goibels uh, who who heads the propaganda ministry and uh, max aman who's is the head of the pub, the publishing uh, enterprise project of uh, hitlers they they try to convince uh, hitler that uh, that instead of killing the uh, newspaper it is owned by a, a jewish family <coughs> why not just buy it off them and run it as the party's uh, publication uh, now this is a classic example of uh, a leading german publication uh, 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 being uh, taken over by the uh, by the party and at that time the valuation of that group uh, was uh, estimated at at some uh, 60 to 80 uh, million marks but guess at what price they they bought it over they bought it over what about 6 7 uh, at 10% of the price less than 10% <coughs> so so this that, that was one example of how they completely uh, you know took over the biggest publication and uh, 
and then they uh, the, the project was to just reduce the number of uh, publications all over the place and uh, and uh, make them bring in new laws capture the advertising uh, association capture the publishers association and uh, and also bring bring in uh, what was called the editors law in which the the editors were also supposed to uh, who members of the association were the publisher editors association was supposed to uh, uh, supposed to adhere to uh, uh, to some basic norms uh, of course jews were not allowed communists were banished they couldn't they couldn't be journalists so uh, so they they had a, they had to have certain commitment to the national socialist uh, uh, you know the philosophy and the uh, the, the objectives uh, so so that so in a very short period what what is fascinating is uh, again i'm just i'll just conclude uh, uh, after uh, my point and making then we can have further discussion how a thriving uh, uh, multi party system uh, alongside a thriving multi uh, uh, kind of diverse and and uh, multi hued uh, media uh, publications uh um uh, uh, in a very short span of time between uh, hitler consolidated his power in i think 19 uh well in in, in, in real term 1933 uh, uh they just bulldozed uh, the entire media space converted uh, everything uh, uh, into one uh, monochromatic you know single hued uh, media space uh the the media that they did they want to take over they just uh, brought ordinance and told them that that please sell your 51% stake to the party uh they they just to buy if a joint stock company they would buy 51% stake the stake over uh, the ones that they didn't care about uh they just kill those newspapers and uh and and, and that's how they uh they they, they just sort of uh, it, it in short with a bulldozer operation so <clears throat> and they uh, they could do it uh, essentially because uh, because the the whole apparatus uh, by then the fascist apparatus uh, the, did not give uh, any breathing space to anybody so you uh, everybody had to fall in line um, so if i uh, again now uh, since uh, viraya spoke about comparison if you compare uh, uh, what happened then in those 4 5 years between 1932 uh, to say 36 37 uh, uh, and the the last chapter is about me- german media during war time uh, war time of course the dynamics changed complete military censorship uh, they could not uh, uh, i mean the business has collapsed so uh, but there, there was a lot of in- curiosity about news so so uh, so they had to ration the, the, the newsprint so they couldn't import enough newsprint so during war time they the party restricted nazi party restricted uh, uh, newspaper to just four pages and uh, and most all the big newspapers were run by them uh, you know, there, there was barely 2 3% of the uh, readership was outside of the party uh, 3 or 5% or there about so they 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 controlled everything they controlled certain uh, they they limited the number of pages but they sold millions and millions of more copies the same group ulstein uh, leading group which had many publications uh, during war time its uh, its circulation doubled to about 7 million from you know 2 1/2 3 million 7 million and uh, some of them made money um, others of course shut down during war time uh, so what i was 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 like 100% control uh, uh, but before that before the war escalated as in when germany invaded poland uh, and started capturing territories by the way when they started capturing territories is the same newspaper uh, went to those territories also so in a sense they got larger market in, in western europe <coughs> so all those things are also recorded in the book so my uh, by way of comparison if you uh, uh, if you compare what happened then with contemporary india uh, i would still say that you are uh, you will be comparing apples and oranges because in india uh, um, i still i believe that uh, the kind of control that the nazi party ex- 
exercised uh, over, over over the media there uh, over 5000 uh, publications uh, a complete 100% capture Th- that in my view cannot happen in india because uh, uh, because the uh, you know the uh, our multi party uh, our system uh, our uh, we are we are so again so diverse uh, culturally uh, linguistically our states uh, uh, have their own uh, media dynamics uh, the, uh, the bjp is not present in the south uh, and uh, and southern newspapers i find that uh, uh, i often tell people that when when we uh, when we uh, paint the entire indian media scene with a broad brush saying that everybody is capitulated uh, i tend to not to agree with the uh with, with that extreme view because i find that that the large parts of uh, the south uh, and east uh, where the the ruling party doesn't have a presence uh, they still have uh, uh, the media there is still uh, uh, operates uh, fairly uh, independently uh, although uh, the center has tried to bring laws and central laws like the it amendment act like the recent pib you know the, the amendment where pib could take down any news that it uh, <coughs> recommend take down of any online news uh, 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 the the broadcast uh, draft broadcast bill uh, the telecom bill. there are various central legislations where which this uh, government is trying to bring in to con- to control the media to gain some uh, social control over uh, the, the media narrative uh, the, i don't think uh, Uh, uh i don't think what happened in germany between 19 uh, say in the decade of the 30s uh, uh, uh could happen here because uh, the dynamics are different uh, we still at, at least nominally we still have a democracy uh, uh, we, we 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 have courts for instance uh, during that period there was no recourse to courts uh, so uh, so we we still have the i'm hopeful we still have Uh, you know high courts uh, staying uh, you know government legislation we try to to muzzle media uh, uh, so we article 19 uh, 1a uh, still uh, uh, there are enough uh, judgments uh, uh, orders by various courts which uh, which still you know do uh, Favor the media uh, or give media that space uh, to exercise its rights. Uh, I would I would give my own wired example. Our our devices were seized uh, in in November uh, early November uh, last year, and we fought the cases and we got the devices. Uh, 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 you know, we got got the devices back. Uh, in, sorry, twenty nineteen. Uh, uh, sorry, twenty twenty two November. so we got the devices back uh, after many months seven eight months uh, so uh, so i think uh, uh, fascism of the kind that existed there uh, total control social control political control uh, uh, yeah, will in my view uh, in, in india uh, the the kind of political cultural linguistic diversity that we have a regional diversity that we have uh difficult to uh, to maintain that kind of homogeneity uh it's possible that that the ruling party may achieve uh, uh what happened in germany uh, achieve close to that sort of control over media and control over thought and mind in the possibly in the in the hindi uh, cow belt region that that that's a possibility uh but but not in the entire country uh is is what is what i would say so thanks i would like to listen to others uh, about what they think sir bol the bolna chahiye to hear me Yes, yeah, yeah, clearly. Then, clearly, you were very clear. Uh, <coughs> I think our uh, chair is having some issues with the audio. 
I request uh, Tista Didi to present thank you, Yeah, thank you so much, uh, yeah. Veera Konduri ji. I'll just, yeah. uh, I'll just supplement a little bit of what Venu said about the book. Not too much because a lot has already been said, but a few observations I made when I read the book before I come to some comparative analyses. One is that, you know, we must remember that this book, Captive Press, has been written by somebody who was in the American army and uh, he recorded these interviews when he was in Germany and that is mentioned uh, by Max Aman uh, when he was facing the denazification trials to think that it would be a more objective uh, assessment rather than the other book that had come out of Germany which he was furious about. And it is true that at that point the German press uh, compared to say the uh, UK press had a high standard whether it was Hamburg, Frankfurt or Munich, you had you had, you had had the world-class uh, newspapers coming out of that apart from the 4,703 uh, small and large publications that were coming out in 1932. So the diversity, uh, both uh, regional and political, uh, because it was not just the Catholic Church and the Communist Party, but also liberal uh, local opinions, which were independently uh, running the press that were important. Uh, what I feel is the progression of how these laws under Nazi Germany came about. I think it's important to understand because in the opening remarks, Virayaji mentioned the UAPA. And I think I want to record that at this point in this country, there are senior journalists who are not held under press detention laws, but are he held under counter-terror laws like the UAPA, which is a draconian provision. Several colleagues in uh, Kashmir, uh, and of course, uh, uh, the news click uh, founding editor, uh, Probi Purkayasta. So I think it's very important to see how this, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, you don't have to use a press law to get at journalists. The, the, the weaponization, the criminalization of the uh, laws itself by this regime is something we need to know. So under the Weimar Republic, for instance, in 1924, they first enacted something called the journalist law. Now, interestingly, this is the one that police permission had to be approval for public placards, etc. had to be obtained. And then you come in 1933, which is under the uh, 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 National Socialist Party when the emergence of the complete authori authoritarian fascist state to the uh, uh, laws that actually start redefining the role of the editor, the publisher, and who the publisher becomes. And that is the 1933 September, October, uh, the uh, editor's laws. And I think those editor's laws are very worth looking at, particularly when we are trying to make a comparison with our country. In between, you have a complete takeover of the public agency, of the, of the uh, news agencies and the journalist associations by the state apparatus in Germany. And uh, so th things like PTI, UNI, ANI, uh, in comparison to Germany, are also completely manipulated and taken over. But what happens with the editor's laws of 33, September and uh, October, I think it's very important, the, uh, you know, what they call is the Rule 10 and the Rule 35 of those laws, is you actually, uh, the role of the editor uh, is is overtaken by a state official who is a member of the National Socialist Party. So it's, he's not an independent thinker, writer, uh, uh, whatever. He's actually, uh, so the editor is defined under the law as a state official. And the publisher is reduced, for, the formal publisher is reduced to the role of a uh, business agent. Yes, and yes. actual publishing, uh, publisher's role is now being undertaken by the uh, propaganda ministry under Goebbels. Uh, so this is the triangulation of authority and the concentration of authority that you see under the uh, uh, editor's law. And then, of course, you have the, uh, uh, the the Reich Chamber of Culture created, which completely takes control not of media and publishing, but of literature, radio, theater, music, films, fine arts, and the press. So it's also all sorts of free expression that are taken control of. And uh, the, the whole aim is repeatedly uh, uh, stated. Uh, and the methodology is often through secret orders. Though the law is laid out in the uh, Rule 10 and Rule 25 of these decrees, but the, and the methods are brutal. It is uh, uh, you know about 1,300 uh, officially. We were told by uh, William Weiss in 1935 that 1,300 Jews and Marxists journalists were purged from the profession. So basically the state will decide 
who has a right to be a journalist or not it's not a journalist who decides uh, whether he's a journalist or not or any journalist association or who credits a journalist but the state that decides that so i think it's important to understand the method and the methodology of how this happened and like i said the methods were brutal state employees were used for this purpose uh, innkeepers and merchants were pressurized only to sell the the uh, official party organs the mayors of the community were uh, uh, were, were pressured and authorized to ensure that only the state organs sell and uh, uh, etc etc and then the complete uh, uh, weapon uh, the punitive measures against the non nazi press before it was completely stifled and taken away and uh, the political directions for purging the publishing industry of all ele- elements which are regarded as discordant or inimical to the idea of uh, the national of national socialism so like i said para 10 and para 25 and 35 were the of, uh, were the most egregious the survey certification and regimentation uh, was undertaken by the state and its agents and i think the interesting part of the book is that well gobels is a household name for anybody uh who studies uh, nazi germany it is it is the like so max saman the vice and others were the actual manipulators of how media control that this big book really brings out that this happened in boardrooms and this things and they actually carried out the uh, ma- uh machinations and secret orders of the nazi regime then we come to the aman ordinances of april 1955 which were directed towards the provincial press because that still survived and that was still very robust and uh, uh then of course you have the entire what uh, what time figures which venus already spoken about so one should like not go into that but this aman ordinance onsen wanted to centralize they wanted to take away the variety of diversity and uh, uh, many many uh, Uh, presences in the media and the publishing because you only had newspaper publishing at that time or periodicals and the idea was to closure consolidate and make sure that people just are squeezed out of business uh and uh, so that was the me- method in which it happened uh, interestingly in the first years of the war when hitler was in power you saw flourishing of the state media and then you as you saw war conditions particularly after the finnish invasion when you saw newsprint etc being affected you suddenly saw the access to newsprint drop so even the state media suffered because of it so it was this kind of cyclical thing that and this minute detail that this book goes into which offers the possibility of understanding how not only the state uh, controls the media but uh, a state control of the media but how they can possibly be resistances and uh, i think uh, it's important to understand that uh, the the function of the rice chamber of uh, culture is is pretty a uh, pretty uh, elaborately described and pretty uh, brutal uh, and uh, uh, the manner in which businesses uh, publishing businesses were taken away and individual journalists penalized particularly if they were defined as marxists or jews uh is is extremely instructive uh i think what is also important to understand is the high educative value that the german press was ascribed to by independent observers uh pre uh, pre the third reich that it was supposed to be a very robust press well informed press and yet it saw this complete in a space of 9 or 10 years this complete takeover and uh, uh uh manipulation destruction whatever words you uh i would then now like to speak about a few themes that were thrown up in the introduction by vidya kunduri where he brought in the uapa for instance uh, and it was interesting that he brought in the uapa because that's not not normally a law that you would bring in and you talk about press freedom but it's very very critical particularly look at pre independence and then you look at the trajectory of uapa which is a counter terror law that was brought in as a into regular criminal law in 2004 Uh, under the upa one regime after the uh, after uh, uh, porta was repealed as a promise under the common minimum program but if you look at the history which i think was also mentioned given today the fact that, that today is 8th october and a historical day in our own freedom movement that it is the pre independence 1908 criminal law amendment act section 16 that bestowed on the british government the power to declare an association unlawful and punish its members and the 1919 anarchical revolutionary crime act the raul attacks that enacted were enacted to curb the growing nationalist upsurge and then of course we saw the massacre jallian wala bag and it bestowed a power on the british government to jail anyone suspected of plotting 
to overthrow the government in jail without trial. And the act has given unjust rights to the police to detain any person for two years uh, uh, without any trial. Thereafter, we saw in 1942 post the Quit India Movement, the Armed Forces Special Ordinance Act enacted, uh, you know, uh, uh, again, which gave with brutal authority to armed forces and paramilitary under the British government. So you had that. And then you had the insertion of Article 22 uh, in the uh, Constitution of India, which was much debated during the Constitution of Assembly that should we have a preventive detention, provision for preventive detention or not. And then you see how, whether it's MISA, NSA, the unraveling of uh, the TADA, the 10 years under TADA, and then the 10 years under Porto, and then Porta. And of course, then actually the induction of UAP, a 1960s law, 67 law actually, which was used for specific purposes and crimes into the normal criminal law. And this is a lot of the abuse we've seen in the last 10 years uh, is because of that law. And I just want to say on record that in 2008, when the very definition of a terror act uh, was uh, changed under UAP, the Second Amendment. Uh, it was uh, it was vehemently opposed by the left, which was still part of the UPA, uh, which had stepped out of the UPA government during the second term. But we need to understand the progression of these draconian laws. And then come to another point which I want to make, that if we look at, say, for instance, the press commissions in India, uh, I mean, one of the most uh, illustrious ones were headed by Justice P.B. Savan, uh, uh, a former judge of the Indian Supreme Court. And when he deals with, and the commission deals with the whole question of who is the ideal ownership uh, for an independent media and talks about the fact that journalists are best positioned, collectives of journalists are best positioned to own the media. And then we come to, uh, uh, I think a couple of facts I'd like to place on record. There was this long interview I did with senior media analysts and watchers in 2014 when we first saw uh, this regime uh, take over, and this was around three months after that. And then one examined very closely the kind of direct benefits being accrued to corporates as high corporate subsidies when there was a whole barrage of public opinion being uh, unleashed against these subsidies, whether it was Manrega or anything else. And it, uh, I quote P. P. Sainath from that interview who told me at that time in 2014 that Rs. 5,71,000 crores were exempted in the 2013 to 2014 budget. And this is a steady and disturbing trend of exemptions to the corporate sector. And this includes rupees 71,000 crores, which was from the income tax, which was exempt. And the budget of uh, Manarega, which is the rural employment uh, guarantee scheme that was much reviled by this government at that time, was much less, uh, came to much less than that. <coughs> so, to elaborate this a little bit more, that the amount, this was not the first government that that uh, wrote off uh, the, the the staggering loans for big corporates. It was even in two thousand five and six there was a complete subsidy of rupees thirty six point five lakh crores, which had doubled by two thousand thirteen fourteen, and uh, uh, the uh, allocation of budget in twenty fourteen for Manadega was only thirty four thousand crores. So I think this uh, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that this benefit, financial benefit given by the Indian state to private capital, uh, I think is something we need to factor in when we come to the next point I'm trying to make, which is that the presence of quote unquote more than millionaires in the Indian parliament, a phenomenon that we've seen increasingly showing a spiraling trend since 2009, but particularly since 2014. The 2014 Indian parliament, for instance, had 353 members out of 545 members of parliament, all worth rupees 10 million and more. And the last parliament before that, 2009, had only 145 members of parliament worth rupees 10 million. Now, why am I making this point here? I'm making this point to suggest that this a, a rare convergence is now happening within the Indian parliamentary structure, hitherto unparalleled, <coughs> which is between corporate business interests, owning controlling shares in television companies and mobile companies and mining companies. So there's a kind of strangulation of the issues that then get discussed and a twisting and manipulation of government policies because of their influence in the ruling parties and opposition in parliament and the uh, and, and their ability to lobby for this. So it's unlikely that those television channels and electronic media channels 
owned by these millionaires who occupy the uh, mostly the ruling party's uh, badge in parliament are likely to carry out independent journalism on their electronic media channels so of course the worst manifestation we see on the electronic media channels particularly in the second uh, term of this uh, nda2 government modi2 government <coughs> which is the systemic and uh, targeted stigmatization slur and hate against india's religious minorities uh, particularly after the corona pandemic 2019-20 when words like corona jihad madrasa jihad etc etc are peddled it is for a commercial and political purpose uh, is what i'm trying to say it's the commercial purpose is because it's linked with political power and the other contracts that they get from this government electoral bonds it has shown us the kind of close conjunction between corporate power and state power that the indian state is converging with and therefore i think we need to factor in this uh, uh, without suggesting yes that it's a hopeless situation in india that unless we are able to control the presence of this large big money and capital within the electoral arena whether it is in terms of electoral funding or whether it's in the presence of who is sits in parliament it's going to be extremely difficult for media to run as truly independent and diverse media it might simply overwhelm the otherwise diverse and extremely robust media that does exist in the country and we have seen so many examples of this not just in the english language but in the hindi language in the tamil language in the odia language etc in fact we had a uh, very interesting meeting of independent media just recently 3 months ago where you saw that there is more and more people young journalists a seasoned journalists emerging and trying to uh, put their footprint in this independent media space finally the the, the, trans, the 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 entire movement between a, an extremely fragile journalist and i remember us being members of the bombay union of journalists many many years ago and actually resisting the contract system uh, for a journalist and you realize that the reason behind that is not simply ideological or monetary but also because as the working journalists union had pointed out at that time and many other journalists association had pointed out it is very closely connected to independent media the moment you are on a contract with a media house uh your your employment is more fragile and you're much more amenable to certain degree of uh insecurity vis-a-vis how your quote and quote publisher teaches you and to make an analogy today your publisher is not necessarily uh <coughs> a publisher who believes in uh decent writing or decent journalism or a plethora of views to come out but that publisher is also somebody with deep rooted and entrenched corporate interests and i think therefore it is that sort of com- comparison i would like to make when i saw this book the obviously nazi joy is a fascinating book in itself the captive press and i i read it through twice thanks to uh viraya kanduri sending it well in time uh, but i think it's also important to remember that the dangers we face today are, are different but they're also very real i'm not, not saying there's a complete takeover possible but there are serious threats available and of course as we know mentioned i'd just like to in a few minutes by saying the kind of laws that have been brought in already and uh, which are attempting to be brought in if this party gets the third term and uh, i flag those here because it's the right to information act the complete uh, dilution of that law which also has a role to play in terms of free flow of information the digital uh, protection data act which gives too much power to the government the broadcasters bill which i think reno already mentioned which is in the offing but also the press registration bill which sought to completely overturn an 1867 law which gives powers to the police to search any uh, publishing ed- enterprise and already you see uh, which is a now now a four year old story uh, since 2021 how the ministry for information and technology is using undisclosed executive orders to shut down youtube channels we've had two examples this week just two examples this week small independent youtube channels being shut down uh, by uh, an order of the mighty and by law that order has to remain confidential which itself is inherently anti democratic and then you find this conjunction of interests between youtube which is a large corporate giant uh, part of google uh, again benefits from uh, uh, carrying uh, favors with the government which in court because i did this long interview with this amazing group of tamil journalists uh, who 
who was served this notice in May 2023 for one of their channels, tribes uh, in uh, Tamil, uh, they asked that what is the reason? They said it's a confidential thing, we can't tell you. So they restart the channel under a similar but different name, after which that one is shut down. So there's a complete conjunction of interest and uh, this thing between YouTube and the uh, union government. That happens a third time, and it's only when they approach the uh, Chennai High Court, Madras High Court, <laughs> that finally the uh, the uh, the uh, they ask the question. The government is asked the question that why are you asking these particular channels to shut down? He said no, because they're carrying speeches of a particular set of Tamil leaders who are preaching Pedia's uh, uh, Pedia's thoughts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the ta- channel dis- uh, channel and the journalists defend themselves, saying, but those are being uttered by independent politicians. We are simply rip- reporting on them, and there is no criminal case either by the central agencies or the state against those politicians. So why are we, we being victimized? Why is the messenger being uh, uh, acted against? And immediately they get a stay from the uh, Madras High Court. But the process takes long. And there's a lot of onus on that individual journalist or that enterprising YouTuber or a small independent media house uh, to go to court and get uh, re- and, and to get uh, some sort of uh, relief. Uh, hopefully relief will always be there. Hopefully our constitutional courts will function. But I think it is a matter for worry that uh, we do not have enough uh, uh, prompter mechanisms to restore and to give uh, protection to the media, even now, even now. And I think uh, it takes a long time, a uh, lot of resources to be able to approach court. I'd like to end again by saying that it is a tragedy in this country that journalists, whether it is in Delhi or in Kashmir, are, uh, <coughs> are actually being held under the UAPA, which is a counter-terror law. I've already mentioned some names, and I think we need to fa- therefore factor in that this danger also exists uh, of completely collapsing the whole question of media freedom between what is supposedly or not supposedly an act of terror. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Viraya Kondori. The last speaker has a problem that everything that I wanted to say has already been said. (laughs) Whether it be about the book or about comparisons with India. Nevertheless, uh, uh, what Professor Adapa, MK Venu, Tista, Saitalwad has already said, I can add best hope to supplement and add to some of the points that have been made. Now, obviously, it would be naive or or too simplistic to compare Nazi Germany of the 1930s and even the early 40s with what is happening in India in the recent past and especially in the last 10 years. It would be, one shouldn't make simplistic connections. But what has already been said by Venu and Tista is that there are definitely some certain similarities. Similarities is to control the way people think. It was read, write and view. What are you reading? What are you viewing? What are you listening to? That hasn't changed. This is the hallmark of all authoritarian regimes, and this continues in India at present. The other similarity is the way you treat journalists as not just political opponents, but because a journalist, she or he is trying to do his or her job diligently, they become enemies of the nation. So I think that these are some very, very obvious and stark similarities. As has already been pointed out by the speakers before me, it is not just the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, even the financial laws, notably the PMLA, the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, the Income Tax Act, The laws governing defamation, the laws relating to sedition, 
the new version of the criminal procedure code the indian penal code the the indian evidence act these are all being weaponized to target not just only the political opponents of the present regime but independent journalists about which already the speakers before me have talked in some length about let me just highlight some points just to add to what they've already said one aspect of the uapa and the pmla or rather the latest the new version of the pmla which has been upheld by the supreme court of india is the complete inversion the about turn of what you say is the burden of proof so if i am the enforcement directorate or the department <coughs> or the national investigating agency or the cbi i accuse you of violating a particular law it is up to you the person who has been accused to prove that she or he is not violated the law or rather innocent and the burden of proof has shifted to the accused rather than the accuser this to me is a new aspect of what is happening in india today and has very 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 strong resemblance to what happened in nazi germany so you don't i mean whether it be obtaining bail whether you can expect a court to even hear you when you don't even know what are the charges against you take the case tista knows him venu knows him my colleague prabir pura he is 76 years old he is in behind bars from the 3rd of october recently there was a major function in delhi because it was been 6 months a lot of people spoke and it was not just the the communists it was also uh, people from other political parties who said but the point is that charge sheet which is supposed to run into 8000 pages we don't know what it is it hasn't been made public all we know that there is a charge sheet that exists together with prabir purakhasta another person who was arrested he is, has supposedly turned a prover when in december in the middle of december why is he still in jail if he's turned a prover we don't know so what is not said is even more important than what is said you have seen what has happened in the case of academics i don't need to go back to what happened to uh, people like professor sai baba professor shoma sen this is something that is very very well known now i want to draw some make some i mean the, the where the situation has changed and the dissimilarities i also want to point out because in certain ways in certain respects things are not just different but you could even argue things have become worse look at the size of nazi germany what was its biggest size at the the when hitler was at at his at his height when nazi germany was at its peak it completely fades in comparison with what is the size of india the numbers involved two the jews as a proportion of the total population and look at the muslims and other minorities as a proportion of india's population i mean the fact is there are more muslims in india than in all but two countries in the world indonesia and pakistan because here you are talking about a country when 1.4 billion 140 crore people so one is the size secondly i want to add to some of the points that tista has made and venu has also made in terms of scale today giant multinational monopolies the digital monopolies and tista just mentioned about how 
uh, YouTube channels and YouTubers have just been shut down and they don't even know what is the complaint against them. Today, these organizations are completely cahoots, hand in glove with big business in India and with the ruling Gucci. Look at the guest list of the people who went to Anand Ambani's pre-wedding celebrations. I don't need to add anything more after that. But I want to just tell you a little bit how the world has changed dramatically in the last few decades in a way that very few of us could have imagined. The internet, the world wide web. The fact is today, two thirds of the population of the world have used the internet at least once. And, and those who haven't used the internet, even their lives are being affected by the internet. I'm just going to highlight two corporations, two giant multinational conglomerates that was, whose founders are today in their 40s. Alphabet, that includes Google, that includes YouTube, and importantly, it also includes the Android app operating system. Now, these are giant monopolies. I mean, most of the hand, uh, handsets, cellular phones in the world have an Android operating system. Only a small proportion have operating systems which are owned by Apple. YouTube, it has a virtual, virtual monopoly on video online. That is available. I'm not getting into the OTT platforms for the time being. Google, look at the monopoly it has on search engines, on, on searches, on aggregation of information. And, 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 and look at Facebook. You have Facebook, Meta rather, Facebook. You have Instagram. And importantly, you have WhatsApp. And India is the biggest user of WhatsApp as a service. The estimates are varied, but you could be talking about something in the region of 600 million to 700 million people who are today using WhatsApp in India. This end-to-end -end encrypted service. And this is where the comparison with Nazi Germany again comes in. Of course, things are different. But behind every major mob lynching in India in the recent past, there's been a WhatsApp message. WhatsApp is part of the weaponization of the ruling regime. So those who are not using WhatsApp are very few. And then look at the dramatic change that has happened in this country. And this, is, this makes us also different from China, which, which has a similar population. I mean, China has denied free access of the giant digital monopolies. But we in India are not just encouraging, we are hand in glove with them. There's so many articles that have come out and so many reports that have come out, whether it be Facebook, whether it be YouTube, whether it be Twitter, how they are complicit with the ruling regime. But let's look at one other aspect, which is also related. You see, these giant digital monopolies, not only are they hand in glove with the ruling regime, they want to control what you read what you watch and what you listen to. Look at the similarities. All India Radio. All India Radio is one of the biggest radio corporations on the planet. In terms of even today, its diversity is unparalleled in the world. But India calls itself a democracy. And tell me which major democracy in the world has banned news and current affairs from All India Radio. Sorry, has banned news and current affairs. I stand corrected. News and current affairs programs cannot be shown by anyone other than All India Radio. There are hundreds of community radio stations. There are thousands of them. There are many, many private FM radio stations, but they cannot show news. So this is again like Nazi Germany. You are completely monopolized news on radio. The only news you can put out is on radio, on the audio medium, 
is if you take your feed from all india radio and as the star and others have pointed out before we are now seeing even the internet being controlled through all these new pro- existing and proposed laws whether it be on information technology whether it on data privacy and the attempts to control even the ott platforms and to shut out them now i want to make two or three comparisons and this is again comparison between nazi germany and india and this has been talked about it quite in detail by tista and also by venu is the control of big business over the media the control of big business over what you see what you hear what you watch and it's not just adani and ambani of course they are very important players they are major controllers of the media but but take the case of the um, india today group in which one of the investments that have been made is by mr kumar mangalam birla school he says it's in his private capacity take the gens the brothers may be fighting with each other but the times of india group is still one of the biggest players in the media as we have today so the captive press in the third reich is a reality in india though obviously don't draw a simplistic conclusion but the fact is never before in the history of india has except perhaps that brief period of the emergency june 1975 it the rules were relaxed by january 1977 indira gandhi lost elections in march 77 if you exclude that period look at the last 10 years how you have how the ruling regime has encroached and they made the so called mainstream media dependent on them for government advertising central government advertising those who are publishing anything critical they are raided by the income tax department take the case of the dhanik bhaskar group and the second wave of covid in 2021 they published a series of reports about about the the bodies floating in mar ganga even a, Guj- a gujarati poet wrote about this what happened they were raided by the income tax department there's another point which hasn't been touched on by tista and venu but i know they are both victims of that and that is surveillance and today what pegasus has done to indian society and similar software is reminiscent of what happened in the 30s and 40s in nazi germany in a new form in a far more advanced form the most dangerous spyware known to human and it's not coincidental that we are the biggest buyers of defense equipment from israel it is not coincidental that mr narendra modi was uh, the first prime minister who uh, visited tel aviv officially and and all, all these facts are there and you know exactly i don't need to tell you what is happening in palestine i don't need to tell you what is happening in israel please join these dots they are linked what you saw in the 40s the early 40s what you saw in the 30s the new forms in which you are seeing it in other countries in the world look at the way artificial intelligence has been misused to target people in gaza look what is happening in india this entire conversation as we are recording it every single word every single uh, uh, phrase is being recorded and being stored in some computer which is being uh, uh, the there of the government of india and so the new googles the new amans of the world they have squeezed out of business exactly what happened in nazi germany of the independent media look at electoral bonds i mean it is the state bank of india didn't give it any detail you should hear what the reserve bank of india governor says you know uh, we have nothing to do with what, what is going on something to the effect my my classmate shri shakti kanta das but what i'm trying to say is much more has come out 
that what we could have ever imagined. Did you know if you hadn't read what Mr. Hemendra Hazari has written, and that has been uh, published in the Wire uh, about how Uday Kuta used what is what was called the secondary market for books. We are learning every day that a, 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 a farmer in Gujarat how ten crores of bonds he bought. So this is a far far more detailed uh, analysis which is being done by the media. Now, what I want to say here and before I conclude my presentation and thank all of you for listening to me, is that the, as Venu pointed out, the economic viability of the media, there are very, very strong analogies with what happened, what Hitler did and what Mr. Modi has done here. And what we are seeing to survive, what the AVP group is doing. You know, the Telegraph can be very critical of Mr. Modi, but the AVP news, the, the Hindi news channel is far more supportive of the government. And we know that. We are seeing this happening across the country. So, you have, as in, in Nazi Germany, you have captured the associations of the publishers the advertisers. And not only that, you are ensuring that those who are opposed to you, you have created that binary. Just as you have polarized society and broken families, you have created binary. You're not with us. You must be against us. And that discourse is going on. My last remarks pertain to Mr. Modi himself. Please remember that Mr. Narendra Modi is the first and so far only Prime Minister of India who has never addressed a press conference, an unscripted, spontaneous media conference of journalists who would ask him any question. Not in the 10 years that he is, nearly 10 years that he's been Prime Minister. He has picked and chosen journalists who are not just ideologically aligned towards him, like, say, Rajat Shah. He has been a part of the Akhil Bharti Vidyarthi Parishad for years. So he's ideologically with them. But there's so many others. Arnab Goswami, Anjana Om Kashyap, Sudhir Chaudhary, uh, a toxic channel called Sudarshan. So many examples. So many examples I can give, and I'm naming them. I'm naming names because it's important to know how the media has been working. And if today Islamophobia is at its peak since the 40s, a huge contribution to this unfortunate and terrible phenomenon has been the media and the so called mainstream media. Now, Mr. Modi has picked and chosen who he'll give interviews to. And they don't ask him difficult questions. They don't ask him follow-up questions. They ask him questions that he wants to. In that sense, perhaps the word Cooley is inappropriate. Cooley's work very hard. The sec large section of journalists, the so-called Godi media, to use Ravish Kumar's famous term, they are not Cooley's. Who, who may be dignified in their name. They are not very different from ad those who work in advertising agencies or public relations firms. The PROs and the advertising agencies are paid to promote a particular product, a particular individual. And this is exactly what has happened. So if Prasun Joshi interviews the Prime Minister, he asks him questions he wants to. Mr. Modi wants to be asked. If the famous actor Akshay Kumar is given an interview by Mr. Modi, he asks him questions which he wants to be asked. So he asks him, you know, Mananiya Pradhan Mantri, our Honorable Prime Minister, my driver wanted to ask you how you eat your mangoes. You want to cut it or do you suck it? So these are the analogies that I can draw with what happened well in the 1930s, in the 1940s in Germany and what is happening in India today. And I hope my 
My views are not unduly pessimistic. Tista and Venu both have said we should not be exceedingly pessimistic. We must hold out hope that the people of this country and the readers and the viewers of and the listeners and the, the, the audiences of this country are able to see through the lies, the half-truths, the, the, the propaganda. And despite the scale, they are able to they are able to uh, remain uh, uh, remain alert, and elections are going to take place. We will wait and watch what happens. Thank you once again, Shri uh, Kunduri. Thank you, Veno. Thank you, Professor Adapa. Thank you, Tista, for enabling or or, or for, or for um, well me being part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. As the uh, chair is having some trouble with his uh, audio connection, uh, I'm going to sum it up. After discussing with Venu when I met him in Delhi and deciding the program, I came across, I came across a video by Srinivasan Jain recently. Accidentally, the title is, Is India's Media is Captured? We are discussing captive press and the video is about how the capturing process is taking place or had happened over the period of time. And he interviewed uh, so many individuals who have been under the scanner are punished for their independent views and also certain news channels for their award positions. Still, we can identify a comparison of how the national media, so part of the national media is reporting about, forget about national media, the mainstream media. That is what we use it to call now. The mainstream media is reporting about the electoral bonds saga. I believe I came to know that the whole Hindi press, the stop writing are referring about the electoral uh, bonds and the aftermath of the Supreme Court uh, judgment. When I was in Delhi as a journalist, I used to come across uh, top uh, references in Indian Express for the month which issue has been covered, considered, discussed by the media magazine. I don't think such kind of uh, references are available now. There are other, uh, I am again going back to the uh, press law inquiry committee appointed by the Constitution, Constitution Assembly, which categorically defines the role of the media, as I referred in the initial remarks, as a current historians, not in the uh, quoted terms of history. Again, they gave out a list of activities, how a journalist should be, how a reporting should be, how a media organization should act, respond. Everything was presented from the eyes of are from the view of preamble that was placed before the Constituent Assembly for consideration. So that was the idea. By that time, we had a good experience from again from Germany about the, the concept of basic structure. It was in the aftermath of Second World War. 
so called uh, liberal intellectuals or liberal intellectual jurists came to an understanding that unless there is outer boundary is fixed the liberal democracy is or will be at fault taking germany and italy as an example the german jurists coined the idea of basic principle the basic structure of the constitution their interpretation is whatever you do within your limits of the constitution you can't go beyond the basic structure so that was discussed in 1970s when it was fundamental rights have been uh, uh, considered as part of basic structure and there are other seven uh, ingredients of the constitution which can't be altered among them fundamental rights and among them freedom of expression is the core issue which is facing a severe threat from the powers that are so keeping that in my mind i suggested uh, to discuss this book and it went uh, uh, appropriately uh, well and the instances and references and one more thing i want to close before uh, i want to refer before closing it's about a reference to mass media the mass media that was in the knowledge of the press law inquiry committee is very limited when it is compared to what uh, paranjeda referred to various forms and shapes of media so it has the ability to stifle the debate and also it has the ability to make up the debate this is what we had seen for the years when the country has witnessed dead bodies on the river ganga during the covid no other alternative version has been presented before the nation by the so called mainstream media so with these all examples before our eyes keeping in mind there is a danger that at some point in future if the things are continuing as it is there is a possibility of comprehensively capturing the indian media the way it has had happened in germany in 1930s with this a sense of alertness i want to thank all the participants and also all the viewers who have been uh, tuned to this uh, uh, channel thank you very much thank you thank you thank you